Colossians chapter 1, and we'll see our theme for the sermon. Come on, Caesar. Come on, bro. Verse 24. You know, we've talked a lot about Jesus dying and going to the cross, but let me tell you a bold fact that, as my daughter says, will knock your socks off. <laughs> Jesus dying on the cross was not enough. And we see this in verse 24 in Colossians chapter 1. It says, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. I see right here, very clear, that there was something lacking in Jesus going to the cross. Are you guys with me here? There was something lacking in his sufferings. Yes, it was awesome he gave us an example. Yes, he went on the cross. And yes, he died for the sins of the world. But there's still something lacking. And Paul lays it out right here. It's very clear. It's the church. It's our responsibility to fill up in our flesh. And we this morning have a flesh. Amen. And that's why we're here because we're in the world, but we're not in this world, but we're not of the world. And so we're here to, to fill up our flesh because it's trying to get filled by all the other junk in the world. So we come this morning to fill up in our flesh what was lacking in Jesus' death. And that's to let the world know. And that's to the commission God gave us. Present the word in its fullness. Church, that is what we're here to do this morning. To learn how to have the Word of God presented, not just the way we like it or the way we want to hear it, because that's what American Christianity has become about. Reading the Bible so it could fit what I wanted to fit me. Christianity buffet, that's what they call it, right? I worked at Hometown Buffet. I know what this is all about. You just get what you want. That's not what Jesus was all about. Because if not, we're not seeking truth. We're seeking what our ears want to hear. And there's something that happened. Every time someone met Jesus, something happened. Number one, they knew where they were at. Yeah. And number two, they knew what they had to do. That's why we see in Mark 10, the rich young ruler go, Jesus, what must I do? And Jesus made sure he knows where he's at. And then he made sure he knew what he had to do. The rich young ruler left sad. Now, there's other people like Peter who's, Jesus, what do I need to do? Well, get behind me, Satan. First, you need to change your attitude a little bit. <sighs> okay, I will. And then he left happy. This morning, I pray that you, yes, you, <laughs> leave understanding where you are at. Don't let this just be another sermon. Yeah, come on. Know where you are at. And, and also, I pray that we, we, we as a church know what we need to do. Amen. The title of the lesson is The Four Resurrections. We're going to be studying the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrection of baptism, the resurrection of the church, and the resurrection of the dead. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. It's been three different scriptures that I'm using today that have already been used, but that's the Lord right there, man. I always get double feelings when I hear someone, like, oh man, they took my scripture. Or, you know what? We need it twice. 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 1, says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. It doesn't matter what you do, you will stay saved. All right, church, I want to make sure we're reading the scriptures. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. In case anybody was wondering, once saved, always saved does not exist in the scriptures. There's none of that junk that, well, if you fell away, you weren't really saved. No, no, no. The Bible says you were saved. But if you stop holding firmly to the gospel, then you can no longer be saved. Amen? Let's keep reading. For what I received, I passed on to you. As of importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter 
and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of them who are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and then last of all, he also appeared to me as one to be abnormally born. For I am the least of all the apostles, and I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I work harder than all of them. Yet it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Right here it's saying that if you hold to this gospel, which gospel really just means the good news. So it's good news what we're holding on to, amen? It says that this is what we hold on to. Jesus really died for us. And I know we say this and we hear it. Even my daughter, uh, yesterday I had her playing with the tablet in the mornings before she watches a cartoon. She needs to read a, a, a story from the Bible tablet series. And so yesterday's was Daniel being thrown in the dine, lion's den. And I always test her. I go, hey, did you really read it? Well, what is it about? And she goes, well, I read about Daniel in the lion's den. And I just learned that Daniel really believes in God. Like what, was, like, what was the details, though? Like, can you tell me what happened? Da Daniel really believed God. And at this point, I'm wondering if she really even read it. But she just goes, and then she explains. She goes, Daniel did not bow down to the wicked king, but then he was thrown in the lion's den and became the lion's friend. He really believed God. I go, wow, that's true. Like, we could believe something and we could say something, but do we really believe it? And this morning, how do you know? If you really believe that Jesus died for you and was raised again, Paul says it right here. He goes, you know what that does to me? It, it, it motivates me to work so hard, harder than any other of the apostles. Now, who are the other people he's talking about? The people that are reading this. Yeah. Do you think that this is like some boast that Paul wants to make? No. He's stating a fact. He goes, I work harder than everybody else. Why? Because it's not really me. I'm just so pumped up about Jesus saving me. You know, there's a CNN article that was uh, put out for Easter called Man or Myth? And does it really matter? Jesus. Saying Jesus, man or myth? And does it really matter? Well, I want to answer that this morning for CNN. Come on, man or myth? Well, just ask the first century historians. And there's countless of historians that write about Jesus as a historical figure, even atheist historians like Josephus, who goes, you know what? I don't believe in God, but Jesus was a real man. And this is what he really did. And even right here, we see some eyewitnesses. He goes, Jesus appeared to Peter, then the 12, then to more than 500. And even says those who are those whom are still living. Basically, you can go ahead and ask them to testify. And some have fallen asleep. He even appeared to follow us to try to strengthen them up. And I'm sure some of them were strengthened and restored. Amen? Amen. But does it matter? Absolutely. David read the scripture to us. If, if, if he didn't really exist, if he didn't really get risen from the dead, then our faith is useless. This means that everybody on the outskirts of Christianity believes that the cross is foolishness. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes we want to cool in up Christianity. Like, like you want to invite someone to church and you want to try to make it sound really cool, like, you know, but it's really cool. And as soon as you say church and Jesus, people know what you're trying to do. And, and you know what? That's OK, because as I studied the resurrection this morning, it, it's so evident that the apostles just went out clearly testifying to the resurrection of Jesus. They weren't trying to say, hey, come, we have this or we have that or or you could get this. No, no, no. guys, Jesus rose from the dead. That's what they were testifying. And that's why the Sadducees were so upset and wanted to kill the Christians. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. And this is what makes us as Christians so much different than any other philosophy or religion. Because you could look in the tomb of Confucius and what do you see? His tomb, his bones. You could look in the tomb of Muhammad or the tomb of Buddha. And what do you see? His tomb and his bones. Yet you look in the tomb of our Lord and Savior and guess what? He is risen. I need to ask you something. How much do you embrace the grace of God? Paul understood. You know what? 
God can forgive me of anything. I killed Christians. I persecuted the church of God. But you know what? There's no sin. And Isaiah 59 says that God's arm is not too short to save. He's not like T-Rex where he has short arms and he's like, oh, you're too far. Or you've gone way too far. You, you've sinned too much. Ponder said there's no wickedness that God cannot forgive. And that pumped him up. You know one brother I'm really fired up about is our new brother, Douglas. Because um, Jack, who's visiting his uh, stepdad in, uh, in Texas, um, gets so fired up about his baptism that he just goes, I want to lead my first Bible study. He's just motivated. He just goes, I'm so grateful. I want to make sure that I, I give back. And so, so Jack goes, hey, I want to lead my first Bible study with Douglas. And then he shows up. And Jack gets a little intimidated. He goes, man, he's, he's Samoan, he's kind of big and buff. Uh, he might not like the Bible study. And, but, but Jack had to overcome some of those fears and say, you know what? Even though it's finals week, I'm going to push a little bit of my time aside. I'm going to overcome a little bit of my fears, and I'm going to work harder. And, and that heart has been transferred over to Douglas. I was with him this morning, Douglas, and Douglas said, like, yeah, I was just wondering, like, like well, what can I do? Like, how do I join ICCM? Or like, what's this? You know, what's the church? What, let me go with you to early. I'm going to be at song leaders. I mean, there is the grace of God. And, and yes, he does sing. So let's be waiting for a, a song leader in the making right here. But, but I could tell by spending time with a new Christian, because they believe the word of God. They believe and, and, and the question for us is, do you really believe the resurrection of Jesus? And if it does, I'm telling you, it'll change your life upside down. Let's go to verse 1 to read this again. The second point, the resurrection of your baptism. In verse 1, we read this, but I want to read it again because it says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you. You see, it's okay to read things over again to remind us. So now I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you have taken your stand. Do you remember that day you took your stand? You said, you know what? I don't care about the junk in the world. I'm taking my stand against the world. The world wants to brainwash me. That's what I think. It's funny that people are like, oh, the church is brainwashing. You know how you are brainwashed by the media, by the people? I'm scared of Nehemiah going to school. I'm scared of Natalie going to school. I'm, I'm actually going and volunteer at her school. I'm, I'm sitting there in class. I'm scared. The kind of stuff she's listening to, what she's watching, she's being brainwashed. And yes, I feel fired up about diving into the word and allowing it to wash my dirty brain that's been jacked up by the world. But we all took our stand. Turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. We see here Jesus laying out a hot sermon because Jesus always laid out hot sermons. Luke 7, after he laid it out in verse 29, says all the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, they acknowledged that God's way was right because they'd been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. What do we see here clearly? If you have not been baptized, then you're rejecting God's purpose for your life. And we also see the opposite. If you take on God's purpose, it's going to lead you to get baptized and lead you to do something else other than acknowledging God's ways right. Those are two different things. Maybe you're coming this morning and go, it's good for me to be at church. I'm like, you know what? It's, it's good. It's, it's, I mean, it's Easter Sunday. I should be at church. It's the one day I should be at church. Um, yeah, you know, I really like the, the, the communion. It, it's good for us to take communion. It's, it, it, it's good of what you're doing. God says that's not enough. It's not enough to say, I have a pastor as an uncle. I have a, my great grandpa went on a mission trip. At the end of the day, none of that's going to matter. Yeah. Acknowledging God's way is right is something that everyone will do if they actually take the time to sit down and study it out. Right. But making decisions is something else. Yeah. Right here, what we saw this morning, our new sister in the line ministry, you saw that there was a new life. Yeah. 
You saw because of the passion, the tears, the conviction. You could tell she took her stand. Look in Romans chapter 6. What do I mean by resurrect our baptism? Well, the church in Rome needed a reminder of their baptism. And so Paul reminds them in Romans 6 verse 3. You know, I feel like this church talks a lot about baptism. Well, let's see what happens at baptism so we can know why we talk about it. In Romans 6, verse 3, it says, or don't you know? And when the Bible says don't you know, it means, hey, if you don't know, well, now you know. No biggie. <laughs> or don't you know that all of us, all of us, if the Bible says all, it means all, right? We could say all and maybe it's not true. Like, hey, babe, you're always late. That's, that's not going to be true all the time. I'm not saying that to my wife. She says that to me. Um, but, but you know what? God is saying all of us. So the whole church, well, let's keep reading. All of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, and we were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. We'll save that for the last point. But right here we see what happens at your baptism. You go down and you come in contact with the blood of Jesus. And, and, and Jesus died on the cross. That's when he shed his blood. When you go down under that water, Colossians 2 says you are buried with him and raised through your faith. Yeah. It's when you participate in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Have you been baptized? Have you had this experience? Because it's very clear, it says, if we've been united with him like this, there has been false unifications that confuses people. Yeah. I remember going to church when I was eager to see God feeling confused. I, I took so many classes at my old church and I, I didn't get the scriptures. We study the Bible with religious people and they just, they, they, they're not sure, okay, how does someone get saved? What is the purpose of the kingdom? Well, what is the church growth for? What is accountability? What is discipling? It becomes confusing. Christianity is not confusing. The world makes it confusing. They say, pray a prayer. You know, something I've been doing is asking people because of the scripture I read that God sets eternity in the man's hearts. Yeah. I've asked people, do you believe in eternal life? And I'm shocked how many people just do. It's in our nature. Yeah. But you ask them, do you know how to get there? And you know what the answer often is? Even yesterday, I asked them, some random guy on the street. I said, hey, I'm going to be preaching tomorrow and I'm going to share about eternity in our hearts. Can I just ask you a simple question? Do you believe in eternity? The guy goes, it's a pretty deep question for a random time there in the streets. Mind you, it was raining because it's always raining. And, and, and he goes, religion has messed me up, man. I said, I'm sorry to hear that, but, but do you believe in eternity? Me and religion don't really do well. I go, okay, let's, I could just tell. There was, there was a sense of, I do, but I'm confused. The world, the churches have jacked me up. And oftentimes people are scared to even go to a church. I got the comment yesterday. I invited someone on Easter Sunday. I go, no, churches freak me out. That's true. You go and you, there's a little temple and you go inside and it, there's no challenging. You come, you hear something, but you leave and it, it, there's no power of the resurrection. I need to ask you, have you been baptized? Not as a baby, not just because you thought this was a good thing and they signed you up, not because it pleased your spouse or your, your parents, but been baptized to participate in Jesus' death. You know, one person I'm really fired up about is a man who a couple weeks ago was battling with this. He's just going, no, th this cannot be the way. And so he, he, he gets a couple Bible studies done with Fernando about the, the New Testament conversions and looking at how every disciple in the New Testament got converted. And later on, he goes, you know what? He sends a text to Fernando. I need to be baptized for real. And Fernando says, well, come to my house. Well, Richard turns around from going to his house. He starts studying the Bible. And of course, he was baptized last week. Richard. Have you resurrected? 
And does your life show it? Does your life show it? And if you have, then is your old self trying to resurrect? And I could tell you it is, because it is for all of us. That's why carry your cross daily leaves no loopholes. You know, people nowadays go, yeah, I just could be at church and I'm okay. No, Jesus says carry your cross daily, not weekly. And everybody's cross is different. Everybody's struggles will be different. But when we resurrect our old self, it leads you to a dark place. And that's why I love seeing people come back to God, because they're a testimony. They go, you know what? I've resurrected my old life. It took over. It was not good. And that's why we saw Jordan and Marissa resurrect their baptism today. But do you need to resurrect yours? Do you love Jesus the same as when you got baptized? I'm not asking if you're doing the same things. I know you are. You come to church. You maybe share your faith. You're giving contribution. But the problem was in Revelation 2, Jesus went to the churches and said, I know your hard work. I know your perseverance. I know that you're claiming apostles to be false doing the discipleship study. But there's one thing you lack. You've lost. No, no, no. You've forsaken your first love. Isn't that amazing that Jesus would take a whole letter to let them know, hey, what you're doing is awesome, but you've lost one thing. You've lost your first love. And when you lose your first love, you lose Jesus. That's why he was outside the church going, let me back in. And when you lose Jesus, you lose your salvation. Do you love Jesus the same as your baptism? This morning I was on a prayer walk with Douglas and I just got reminded of my first love because Douglas is praying. He's going, God, I want, I love you so much. He kept saying, I just got, I love, I can't wait to be in heaven so I could give you a hug. God, I just love you. You've been so good to me. I go, wow. I just kind of like, ouch. You ever pray with someone? You go, dude, stop convicting me. Like, ouch. It's almost like, man, that was my first love. And, and coming up in about a week and a half, I'm going to have my sixth spiritual birthday. And, uh, it's always sobering to have a spiritual birthday because then I know that I'm the same age as my daughter spiritually. So I go, ooh, as soon as I think I know something, Natalie's barely learning. You know, she's, she's barely going. So I look, that's, that's how I look spiritually right there. Um, and so why, why do I get fired up about spiritual birthdays more than my physical? Because my physical birthday, I, I didn't really remember my birth, and I think my mom needs to be praised more than anything for my birthday. But, but my spiritual birthday, I'm reminded of my walk with God. And, and I, have, I do something kind of, um, personal between me and God, I keep it in my diary, which is Word Docs online. So manly, amen, still manly. <laughs> my Google Drive. Um, but, but every year I title my, my year something. So my first year was Jesus is my Savior. Because he's this, this the year he saved me. And then my second year, Jesus is my friend. Because that's when I learned we have fun in the kingdom of God. And Jesus third was my brother because now we went through some struggles, but we're resolving things out. And so Jesus is my brother and so forth. I still got to come up with my sixth one since it's coming up. But I'm more convinced now that Jesus is Lord. I'm more convinced now that one day every knee will bow and say Jesus is Lord. The difference is how people will say it. Either they'll go, man, Jesus is Lord. Whoa. Yes, it was worth it. Or Up. I knew it. Shouldn't have walked away. I should have said yes. Have you been baptized and have you resurrected your baptism lately? Let's go to Ezekiel 37. The third point is the resurrection of the church. I thought since it's Resurrection Sunday, we just got to go through different resurrections. Ezekiel 37, we see another scripture that was quoted, but amen, the Lord wants us to hear this twice. Ezekiel 37. Now, before we read this, I want us to understand something. Why is the Old Testament a lot bigger than the New Testament? You ever thought about that? Like, you ever look at it, you go, oh, wow, like, hmm, why? Because God in the Old Testament has taken his people through a journey. He, he took the people out of Egypt and Travel them all the way to the promised land. Why? Because it teaches us all the lessons we need to learn. That's why in this church, we're a Bible church. 
We're restoring first century church, but in the first century church, they used the whole Bible. Matter of fact, they only had the Old Testament. That's what they used. What is the symbolisms we see in the Old Testament? Well, number one, the Israelites were under the slavery of Egyptians. You ever seen Prince of Egypt? That's what that's about. Maya, you haven't seen that? Jamie, make sure she watches Prince of Egypt. She needs to have a childhood. So, so, so what do we see there? We, we see that the Israelites represent us when we were enslaved to our sin. Now, whether people want to admit it or not, they're enslaved to their sins. And, and, and then God took them out and crossed them through the Red Sea. We know from 1 Corinthians 10, that's like us crossing the waters of baptism. And then where did they go after the Red Sea? To the promised land? No, no to the desert. What's the desert symbolize? The Christian life. The Israelites were just kind of wandering around, getting bitter that they don't have manna, getting bitter that they have too much manna, getting bitter that they're thirsty, bickering again. That's us in the promise, before the promised land, wandering around. And then it says that we're crossing over the Jordan River, which symbolizes death. And that's why we sing that song, crossing over. The Jordan River, we're bound to cross. All of us are bound to cross the Jordan River. We're all bound to die. But then the promised land is heaven. Do you see God's lessons and teachings he wants to show us? And so the Old Testament is really just a physical foreshadowing of the New Testament. And so let's look at this vision, understanding that. And the vision he gives to Ezekiel, I believe, is the vision for us even today. Amen? Amen. Verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he set me in the middle of the valley. And I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. That's a safe answer to give to God if you're not sure, right? I mean, God's hand is upon him, and he takes him to the valley to see a bunch of dead bones. Could you picture that for a second? Ezekiel's hand, God's hand is on Ezekiel. And I don't know if you ever felt like God's hand is on you. And he's kind of forcing you to realize where you are at. That's God. He's like, his hand was on me. Nobody wants to go to a valley of dead bones. You have to be lifted up by the spirit and be put there. And then he goes, what do you see? Dead bones. Well, well, do you think they could live? Ezekiel's like, this is a tough one. And and, and when you don't know how to answer God, you just go, you alone know, Lord. (laughs) You know. That's that's a safe way to cop out of an answer. Well, let's see what God responds to him in verse 4. Then he said to them, prophesy to these bones. Say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to the bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So, I prophesied as I was commanded, and I was, as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. The bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he was commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood upon their feet, a vast army. Wow. God resurrected Israel. Do you see that? But it took motivation. Why did he do that? Number one, so that they could have the breath of God enter them. That's awesome. You remember how God made Adam and Eve? It kind of says that he just breathed life into them. He just breathed life into them. For us, God breathes life into us. Why? So that we could have flesh. So that we could be turned into a vast army. How are you going to be turned and resurrected? Get prophesied to. Prophesy to yourself. The mornings with your time with God. If you're visiting the Bible studies you're going to be in, prayfully after your church when someone invites you to a Bible study and you say yes, when they prophesy to you, they're turning your dead bones to flesh. God is wanting to breathe life into you. And how do we resurrect into a vast army? Expect obedience. Expect obedience from yourself. 
That's a simple question. Do you read the word of God expecting obedience from yourself? When someone shows you a scripture, are you going, amen, whatever this says, I want to obey it. Because I'm tired of doing it my way. My way does not work. My way is not the highway. Jesus is the highway. But why don't people want to be prophesied to? Because rattling starts. Right here, God says, prophesy. What happens? These bones kind of just start rattling up. I don't know if you've been Halloween. You see those skeletons kind of just pretty scary at night. You drive by, you see skeletons. Drive fast. But people rattle because they don't want to be prophesied to. The things that Jesus says, I have all authority. Go and make disciples, teach them to obey. People don't like any of those words. Who likes to learn how to obey? I'm an adult. That's what people think. I'm an adult. Authority? Nah, people don't like authority. Like, my authority ended at 18 years old when I became a man out of my parents' house. No. God says, I still want to be your father. And I want to take care of you. And if you want to be prophesied to and turned into a vast army, there's going to be some rattling. As I mentioned before, American Christianity has become a joke. Because there's no sense of prophesying and there's no sense of rattling. And that's why in this day and age, you can see homosexual preachers and people think it's okay. And if anyone tries to speak against it, guess what? Those people are hated. How could you tolerate that? Everything could be tolerated except one thing, intolerance, truth. Nowadays, people have the false idea that, 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 that to, to unify Christianity, we just accept everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. Yet that was not Jesus' plan. He looked straight into the 12 and said, do you want to leave too? After a couple of years in the ministry, Jesus goes, do you want to leave? I'm willing to start over my ministry again. I'll probably have to be here three years, but I'm sure I'm okay with that. I just have to put in a... a, a, a Notice to God that it wasn't done, you know, that it wasn't prophesied that he's going to come for three years. So, I mean, five years, he's willing to start over for the sake of truth. That's what Jesus came with. Jesus came full of grace and truth. Yeah. Yeah. I need to ask you, do you want to resurrect this church? I believe it's going to happen by expecting obedience Personally, I love what Tomotaka shared. I mean, a lead minister comes to Bible talk and says, wow, this is New Testament church. And yet if we want to resurrect and continue to resurrect first century church, there will be some rattling. And we as a church need to develop convictions that this place will be a place where we love each other, where we're humble towards each other when there won't be sin tolerated. Now, we will work with the weak and we will love them, but when someone flat wants to not obey the scriptures, then, then this is not the place for them. That's right, bro. When I look at this resurrection of Israel, what fires me up is the way the people respond. Look in verse 11. On, the vision is explained. Just like Jesus explained the parables, God explains the visions in the Old Testament. Are you guys with me? It says, verse 11, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. In case you weren't getting it, Ezekiel. They're saying that our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. We're cut off. You ever have one of those days? Our hope is gone. We're cut off. We're all dried up. Verse 12. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I am going to open up your grave and I will bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then my people will know that I am the Lord, the one who opens up the graves and will bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and I will, I will cause you to live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, has spoken What an incredible passage that it explains. God explains what people are saying. And and, and you know what? It doesn't matter what you think you're saying. God will show you what you're saying. And he's saying that the people have lost hope. And maybe you're coming in this morning losing hope. Feeling like my hope is cut off. Maybe barely make it in this morning. And you know what? You're part of the house of Israel. 
Because Israel means struggles with God and struggles with men and overcomes. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter how you come in. The important thing is how you leave. And how you leave determines on how you respond to the word of God. Do you feel like you're in the grave? God doesn't say, don't worry, you're fine. No, he says, yeah, you are in the grave. But I will open up the grave. I will resurrect you. And I will resurrect your ministry. And I will resurrect the church. I will resurrect the whole house of Israel for two reasons. So that my spirit could be in you. And so that you could settle in the land. I think some of us just need to settle in the kingdom of God. Settle in. Like, is this where you're going to be? Then settle in. This is the best investment. This is where you are going to lay up treasures in heaven. This is where we get to build one another and see the results. You know, our former movement in the ICOC, at one point, this was a life. A vast army was created. And how do we know that? In the recorded history of churches since the first century, the ICOC became the fastest growing movement ever. That's powerful. With 29, 30 disciples that met up in, in 1979, at the year 2000, churches were in all 171 nations. Not all nations. 171 nations close to all nations. And yet God, he didn't let it get to all nations because of sin. He put a stop to it. And, and, and there was a devastation of losing the, the, the zeal because people did not want to be rattled anymore. People did not want to believe the truth. And what ends up happening is most of the churches lost about half of its members. Most of the churches changed the name from ICOC to just their city with COC, Church of Christ. Why? Because they saw we're no longer international. And they went to autonomy. Why does autonomy kill? Because it's not the plan of Jesus to unite the churches. And yet now what we see God doing in the new movements when we see God laying out a plan, even in 2009, where, where the, the plan was laid out. And this is why I need to remind you guys what Portland's all about. It's almost like God has implanted in us. We cannot lose faith because this is where it all started. We can't say people aren't open. We can't say that, 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 that things cannot happen. How do we know that? The world sector leaders in our days, those that are leading the nation, they just came from Portland days. Back in the days where, where, where Michael Williamson was leading the van house, what was it, what was it called? Kuvites. Kuvites. Been, Facebook has been reminding us of the Kuvites from years ago. And, 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 and what we see is God multiplied a ministry to now 2009 to see 65 churches, almost 5,000 disciples, and to see that God is starting something else. But you got to make sure that you are comfortable with a little bit of rattling. That people are going to get in your life and expect you to obey the Bible. I don't know about you. That makes me feel safe. That makes me feel comfortable. That makes me settle here. Because I know that sin's not going to creep up. I know that when my daughter grows up and she's a teen or she's in the back, she's not going to hear bickering from the disciples. She's not going to hear attitudes. She's not going to see a bunch of sin going on. What she's going to see is a place where people love God, where people obey God. And yet, that's what we want. That's what these people wanted. They go, our hope is God. God says, yes, it is, but I will resurrect you. Do we want this church resurrected? I believe we do because we see the results. And I believe this church is an incredible church. Even just to see Cheryl was restored a few years ago on Easter Day. And to see now she has her incredible husband by her side. And now on the same Easter Day, Jordan gets restored. But the bones needed to be rattled, but the revolution started. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Let's go, bro. 1 Corinthians 15, the last point, the resurrection of the dead. Back to where we started here. In verse 50, we read, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen. Are we listening? Amen. Yeah. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. 
For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of the sin is law. But thanks be to God. He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that the labor in the Lord is not in vain. Why do we always talk about resurrection of the dead? Because all the scriptures talk about the resurrection of the dead. In, in John 10, when Martha lost Lazarus, and she was so sad. You guys remember that? And, and she even gets a little bitter at Jesus and goes, Jesus, if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. And how does Jesus respond? He says, I am the resurrection. And whoever lives by believing this will receive eternal life. Jesus said, you know what? Yes, Lazarus is dead. But I am the resurrection. And, and I love the scripture because it says the sting of death is saying, you know what? Disciple or not disciple, when someone dies, it stings you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it hurts. And yet, as disciples, you can imagine this. Because the honest truth is, yes, we're all going to die. And the honest truth is, is we all really believe in eternity. It, even if, if we could be honest, we all believe in eternity. We know that God has planned something greater. But maybe religion has jacked it up. Maybe past experiences. Maybe you've been blinded or being corrupted or being choked. But I get excited about what's going to happen. Yeah. That is fires me up that in one twinkling of an eye in one little flash we're all going to be changed that we're going to receive a new body i mean does that fire you up yeah. i mean i've been working out with douglas and we worked out this morning trying to get i mean i look at his body I go let's be humble and imitate you know trying to trying to get buff so i asked him you know hey your football days give me some of the training and, and we worked out even this morning and 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 i know that it's going to take a long process <laughs> let's just say that and just pray I don't give up, you know, that's, that's, but in one twinkling of an eye, everything is going to change. The mortal will be clothed with immortality. Doesn't that just sound awesome? Yeah. Immortality. And yet, if we want to not be swayed from this, we need to stand firm. This is why we believe what we believe, guys. That we stand firm. That we don't let anything move us. You don't understand my situation. Let nothing move you. I understand the scriptures. And I've known, I, I know for me, some of my problems for someone else are a joke. And, and, and the same thing could be for us. Maybe you're carrying a different cross. And we want to bear with each other and help each other. But I want a church where I'm going to be challenged. And continue to be called to let nothing move me. Think about this last week. What moved you? What swayed you? What stopped you from always giving yourself fully? This isn't talking to lead ministers. I think this is the false idea. We come into the church feeling like we're just consumers, like we're just buying something. Well, I gave my contribution, so I deserve to listen to a sermon and be a part of a church. No, 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 no. We're all in the same battle. Yeah. We're all called to, to, to preach the word always and fully. But some of us are at work. Some of us are at school. That doesn't stop. Some of us are parenting our kids. Some of us are going on a day with our spouse. You know what? That's still always giving yourself fully. Because everything we do, we do with all our hearts in the name of Jesus. Why do we do what we do? Because we really believe this. We really believe there is a resurrection of the dead. And we really believe going now, even this week, it needs to be something that pumps us up. Not just one day, but that's how we live every day. We testify to the resurrection. And then... We could always give ourselves fully, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, isn't that awesome that we got to see, you know, last two weeks, six editions. But this is what's funny, is in the beginning of, of the year, of the month, we set out a goal before the church. That we said, we want to see 75 editions despite sending out disciples to different mission teams. Yeah. 75 editions. So we thought through, we said, okay, this is going to mean eight editions each month. And so we went through the first week of March first three weeks 
And we had four. So I go, okay, this week, we need to be praying to have four additions. And how awesome that by the end of the week, God sporadically, you know, even last night, just making it happen towards where he says, you guys are going to get four additions this week. The goal that we have before the church of special missions, 25 times our pledge. What that means is as a church collecting 79,000, how is this going to happen that we resurrect from the dead? And that we trust him, now not just give him, but be so fired up and proud of it. That's the right. bickering comes when what happens, we have a false understanding. Oh, where is missions going to? Where is exactly? Is it going? I, I even heard this last week. Someone going, man, I, I just have a feeling that missions mostly goes to paying ministers. You know what? You're right. It does. Why do we do that? Because in other churches, they're going to be spending money on TVs and church, and church buildings and parking lots and programs. Right here, we believe in Jesus' method of training a few that will train a few that will be full-time to devote themselves fully to the work of the Lord. And I don't want us just to accept it. I want us to be fired up that we do that. <laughs> Sending people to Seattle is not going to be the last time. We're going to be giving more disciples to more churches. We're going to be giving missions again. And if you live your life going, oh, just do it, then you're not going to be making it. We embrace what we do as a church. We're proud of it. We're not afraid to tell someone, you know what? In our church, we give 25 times. We go tagging. We beg for money. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We are beggars. I don't care. Because that's what I give my life to. That's how I live for Jesus every day. And yet for us, we need to understand what's happening in the movement right now. The rattling that's going on. In last month, in the, in the last month, February, we planted a church in Bogota, Colombia, known to be one of the most dangerous cities. The guy that first invited me out leads the campus ministry there, Malcolm Abbott. Awesome. I mean, this guy went from being just a white guy in Fullerton, only knows English, to going to Sao Paulo, learning Portuguese, to going to Chile, to going to Mexico, and to going to Colombia. Wow, that's a testimony right there. But now there's a sold-out church in Colombia, and I love going on Facebook and seeing the baptisms they're having. Just next month, we'll see a church resurrect in Seattle, where all the churches coming together, some from Syracuse, some from Boston, some from L.A., some from Eugene, some from Portland, 10 from San Francisco, developing a team to resurrect the church in Seattle. Yeah. And yet we have our very own Jacksons going, amen. <laughs> and a few months after that, we see that we're going to be sending the church to Dubai that that team is going to resurrect. And then a couple months after that, we see that Chennai in South Asia is going to be having their first South Asia missions conference. And from there, they're going to send out the church to Bangalore. I mean, now we see disciples making disciples, but also churches making churches. This is what you're a part of. And I don't want you just to accept it. I want you to settle in and enjoy it, embrace it. And when you understand the res resurrection of Jesus, that's exactly what you're going to do. When you understand the resurrection of our baptism and not our old life, let's put that aside, then we'll understand the vast army we are in. And we'll see the resurrection of the church. And then we'll get to resurrect in, in the last days and it's going to be glorious and we're going to be able to do it together not just as a vast army but as a family of God I love you guys let's have a happy Easter